No. No, thank you. See, I have a permit. A permit? <laughs> from whom? Oh, from God. Oh, you see, it's not that I mind jokes. Oh, no, 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 no jokes. These goats belong to Job, right? Yes, Job, who is, I might add, a particular favorite of God. So... Hey, panelists, welcome back to the show. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. And this is going to be a spoilerful podcast about Good Omens Season 2, Episode 2, entitled Clue. And the synopsis, Steve? Aziraphale arrives to stop Crowley from killing the innocent children uh, of Job. Ironically, Job's kids are quite the arrogant, spoiled little brats. Uh, it's also revealed that Crowley never actually killed the goats, and he wants to protect the children as well. They wait out a storm together, waiting for the coming of the angels. Interesting. Uh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it is an interesting concept, not according to any biblical books that we've read uh whether it be baptist catholic uh, catholic christian any kind of sect within the the uh catholic church or yeah. how it is presented as such it's an interesting take yeah and i we were we were briefly talking about it before we started recording uh that this was a, this was a tough one for me the first time i watched it because i i, I was trying to separate my personal beliefs from yeah. Like what we said before, realizing that this is a, I don't want to Christian explain things to everybody, but this is like <laughs> when I, what I realized today after I watched it the second time was this is the non believers kind of perspective on how they see the Bible, how they see accounts in the Bible. I, I believe, and I think Mark is, is pretty close to my, these are historical accounts. They're, these are, are true. These are not, yeah. this is not mythology. This is not, you know, this is uh, what we were brought on, uh, brought up upon and learning and brought up within that religious culture. Mm -hmm. And like Steve had stated, it, it's the non believers, people that weren't brought up with those beliefs. It's their alliteration of what they would do, or in this case, a fictitious kind of view. Mm -hmm. Very similar to what we talked about when we covered Preacher, too. Because right. with Preacher, we did the same thing because that was taking out of context as well, but it was based after a comic book. In this right. case, this is a new season. There was no there was no IP or no uh, sort of like foundation for it to be written upon uh, and adapted from. So this is something coming from Neil Gaiman's mind, which is, you know, you, you take it with a grain of salt. As mm -hmm. I always like to say, you, you take the story as it is because you're looking at the humor in it. You love the characters, which would be Azarafal and Kerali, and what their uh, their collaboration as as friends, mm -hmm. as well as the parallel between Nina and uh, I'm forgetting her, the other Maggie. one's name, Maggie. Maggie. Okay, right. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's that's really where my initial thought was, and as I watched it for the second time today, kind of catching up on going, okay, I, can I can I set my personal beliefs aside and just watch the, the humor of yeah. it, you know, and knowing that like there, and I for, I had totally forgotten until I kind of uh, went through the uh, episode one again earlier this week about the Job quote in there, and that's <laughs> uh, uh, that that quote from uh, from Job, and I can't remember the exact chapter 41 or something like that uh, is talking about a dragon, you know, a, a breathing yes. fire dragon. Basically what, what we have is that in scene with between Job and God is God basically telling Job, who are you to question me? Mm -hmm. You know, who, who yeah. are you? Where were you when I did this? Where were you when I did this? Where were you, you know, how do you hold back the four winds? How do you tell the, the lightning where to go and make it report back to you? These are all direct quotes from the book of Job or, or fairly, direct quotes from the book of Job that uh, is basically what happens is, is to, again, not to Christian explain it or Bible explain it to anybody, but the story of Job is, is very similar to what they, they told here is that uh, uh, God and Satan are having a, a 
conversation basically and and god <laughs> says look at my servant job how how uh, righteous he is and how good he is and basically satan says well that's because you've treated him great all his life and you've never done anything bad to him but if you do bad things to him he'll curse uh, your name and die and so god uh, the first time god gives him gives uh, the devil permission to smite his family and his mm-hmm. worldly goods and he loses everything uh, except his wife and then uh, the second time he comes back and and he says well you can uh you know, the, the devil kind of comes back and says, well, yeah, you took all of his worldly stuff away, but you didn't do anything to his body. And so God says, fine, you can you can now go after his body, but you can't kill him. You can do nothing but killing. So he the devil covers Job in sores. Basically, if you've ever had a uh, oh, gosh, a boil. That's what he if you yeah. ever had a boil. I've had one boil in my life. And oh, my good. It's the, one of the worst things ever. To yeah. Have. Uh, yeah. And he, he covers Job in boils. And, and basically, Job comes out of that without cursing God though, basically saying, you know, dust, I was given dust. I we, uh, you know, from the dust, I came from the dust. I'll return. God gives and God takes away. That's yeah. another, that's a direct quote from that's Job. He says, yep. God's given me great things and he's taken away great things. Uh, I don't know why I don't understand it. And he does ask that question throughout the book of Job. He says, why is this happening? But he never curses God. Like you see at the end of the episode, when the wife kind of starts to say, she's going to curse God and Crowley jumps oh. in and stops her, you know, <laughs> yeah. But then you get to the end of the book of Job, and of course, uh, the the storm they're talking about is God answering Job out of the thunderstorm. And basically, like I said before, answering Job's question with, who are you to question me? Yeah. And then he does give Job back all of his worldly possessions. He has more children and yeah. uh, and all that. So the, the, the story is kind of twisted a little bit here. Yeah, it's kind of twisted in the sense that they give... Crowley and Aziraphale, the way of giving Job back everything that he needs instead of God himself or mm-hmm. themselves. We, you know, and it, it's kind of an interesting take, but it, you have to take it with a grain of salt because this is a, a, a fictitious kind of story and mm-hmm. it, it's presented to us, but it, it's a little bit educational, but hopefully it'll throw people to going to the Bible and actually research it too, you know, yeah, it, it'll, it'll preserve a little bit more faith in people and to actually read the Bible to see what is the truth of what where it came from, yeah. where where did this come from it, itself too? Because a lot of like what Steve was saying, there is truths out there as far as what was written, but it was alliterated for the show, mm-hmm. and it, it was entertaining, yes. You had your laughs, yes, especially when uh, the fact that Job's oldest son, his eldest son, is played by David Tennant's son. Oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah. (laughs) And I believe his father-in-law plays Job himself. Okay. So I could be wrong. I'm sure uh, Derek from uh, TV Podcast Industries will listen to this and be like, "No, Mark, it was this person." But, yeah, I can't uh, wait to I can't wait to fire up uh, their <laughs> podcast about this episode and see what they thought but of it. But so. I, I do know that 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 was Tennant's son who played uh, Job's eldest son, okay. uh, because I could I recognized the face because they saw them both together at a convention, and you could see how mm-hmm. they look a little bit alike. But it was pretty cool to see. It's like wow. Tenet still looked like a uh, you know a hippie from the sixties with the glasses <laughs> his and everything. His beard, his beard and hair is just crazy. <laughs> I, I think Tenet embraced this in the sense of I get to play all the wacky stuff that I can't do before mm-hmm. now and this and have fun with it, especially yeah. with all the music and everything that we get within the show itself too. And uh, I really think both him and. Michael Sheen are are just having a great time and a ball with this. Yeah. And, and this is guided literally by Neil Gaiman himself. So uh, I, yeah. I'm loving the uh, the talk within it, the atmospheres that we do get within the episode, too. So mm-hmm. uh, instead of the coffee house, they go to a pub and even Crowley says, hey, <laughs> uh, finally, a pub. <laughs> right, right. But then, of course, of course, uh, uh, Mr. Fell gets gets met by the community outreach person who's like, "Oh, we're going to have our next community meeting at your shop," you know. And yeah, as, this is why I don't come out. I loved. I think you know, I loved kind of the B story here with uh, with the Maggie and Sarah, No, kind of the the 
the B story with the angels and Gabriel and oh. this, every, the, the song every day. And I thought it was kind of cool that uh, yeah. the angels, when they showed up and I, I was a little confused by this. I think I figured it out in the second, in my second viewing that the angels just didn't recognize Gabriel. I thought for Correct. a second that they didn't, they didn't even see him, but they really didn't, they didn't recognize. They didn't him. understand his, vi- uh, his visualization. They only saw when, I guess when they saw him up in heaven, they only saw his soul and now yeah. his soul or whatever makes Gabriel, Gabriel, they couldn't see on earth and it's just yeah. a vessel at this point. So they didn't see Gabriel as he was, whereas yeah. Crowley and Aziraphale look at it as like, okay, it's still Gabriel, but it's part of a shell. There's well, only see, this a is, little bit that's in there. That's that's what I'm getting out of it. What I This is what I think. I think the miracle that set off the alarms in heaven that mm-hmm. uh, what is the one the one angel says it was 25 Lazari. Uh, yep. I thought that was a great uh, me- uh, measuring unit. I think it. It was not their miracle, the half miracle of Crowley and Aziraphale. I think Gabriel unconsciously did a miracle to hide himself from the angels. Because remember, they said it was archangel level miracle. Correct. Yeah. Set off those alarms. And so I think we're going to find out like at the end of the season, they're going to flash back and they're going to show us things that we didn't see You know, Mm. other other things that happened that Gabriel did unconsciously while he was hiding out there in the bookshop because he had to have find some way to make himself be hidden from, from the angels. That's what I think. I, I could be totally wrong on that, but uh, watching it today again, I was like, yeah, they don't recognize him, but they see him. And, but yet Aziraphale and Crowley recognize him. Yeah. They so, recognize the, the visual person of what mm-hmm. he represented even in, in heaven. And they always feared yeah. because they're like, oh, my goodness, <laughs> we, we I, oh, oh, he's yeah. not the same person. So they see the shell of what he used to be. There's probably mm-hmm. a quarter of what he used to be because he's still learning and adapting. And yeah, I just like I said, I, I think, yeah, yeah. And that's what remember last week. That's what Aziraphale, when he first saw him mm-hmm. and Gabriel didn't know who he was, even Aziraphale was like, well, you look like Gabriel, but I don't know if you really are Gabriel. Yes. And that's when the whole thing of Jim and James changed, you know, changed up. So, <laughs> yeah. So I think it's, it's going to be interesting in the next coming weeks to see, you know, and that whole stuff about the song, the records changing, all the songs changing to every day, yes. you know, by Buddy Holly. That, what... that, that, that's a, a hidden clue. I think that will come out later on. Yeah. Because uh, and the fact that she keeps, keeps getting returns of these records yeah. and, and it, there's a hidden message in it. So you, the listeners, if you have any idea, that's where feedback comes in to play. If you have any idea and thought, obviously we are not watching ahead. I'm not watching. Steve not. is not either. So uh, we're, we're just doing episode by episode. So if you have an idea, let us know. And don't be cheating and saying, hey, well, it says this in episode six. No, <laughs> yeah. We, yeah. we are going this. You know, it's like if you're following us episodically, it would be great if you had an idea of where we're at to with, along with you. Yeah. So that would that would be great. Uh, I do love the body holly and the crickets. I, I just love 50s rock and roll. Uh, and I, I just hearing that and just hearing the fact that, you know, the record store clerk actually has these uh, vinyl records, but they're always getting returned. Yeah. I wouldn't return that. I actually own a copy. <laughs> I have a 45 of that. So I well, they know. had plenty of them. They had plenty of them because they said <laughs> every every record she sends them changes into every day. So they're sending them back going, hey, this is not what we ordered. So uh, uh, no, I, and I, that's what she said is, is that she sends them 45s and to put in their jukebox and somehow during while they're in the jukebox, they change into meaning this. that there's some subliminal message that heaven or hell mm-hmm. or the big ohm that's out there is changing these records into right. every day by Buddy mm-hmm. Holly and the Crickets. Meaning yeah. there's a hidden message in there. Let us yeah, know exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's we're going to find out by the end of the season uh, what it is, though. Um, I thought there was a funny runner 
in the fact that Crowley said, I have a permit um, <laughs> when, uh, when he's first sacrificing the groats, the goats, and then with the children. And uh, that was a, I don't know if that was a conscious or an unconscious callback to uh, Parks and Rec. If anybody remembers Parks and Rec, uh, uh, Ron Swanson <laughs> is about to butcher a pig in the middle of a park. And he says, yep. Oh, I have a permit. I have a permit that says I can do what I want. And the guy's like, no, you're not going to butcher a pig in the middle of this. So I thought that, I don't know if that was a conscious or an unconscious callback to Parks and Rec, but uh, I think, I think it, <laughs> Had to have been. Could have been in, unintentional. So uh, it could have been unintentional, but even still, it does work in the same place. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was great. Uh, wow. Uh, yeah. I, I just love the act, uh, the, the idea too that heaven and hell can't tell Gabriel of who he mm-hmm. is. That, that, that was another point that I, I just loved the fact that they're looking dead at him and he's like, well, I, I'm going to put these books in alphabetical order. Within the, the first, first sentence. sentences, yeah. <laughs> by the first sentence, I was like, "Oh!" <laughs> and uh, I'd love to know. I, I wonder if TV podcast industries did a deep dive into those some of those books that he had. Of course, we know that uh, the the one book uh, it was the best of times, the worst of times. That's Charles Dickens, yes. you know. Uh, but some of these other books, I don't know what they were, and I'd be interested to hear uh, to see what they the the, yeah, my, they the went day my deep grandmother dives exploded. Into that. <laughs> yeah, the day my grandmother exploded. Uh, that kind of thing. I, I wonder if these are going to be you know hints for something future in the in the season. It's going to be interesting to see that uh, how that goes. Um, what hmm. else? Uh, someone's coming to verify the miracle. Is Zerifel lies to the angels about? Yes. What happened? He says, oh, I did a miracle that made these two fall in love. And now we've got to make them fall in love. And uh, but yet at the end of the episode, he he tells Crowley, oh, I'm going to leave. I'm going to take the car and go investigate this this clue. And you need to stay and watch after the bookshop and watch after Gabriel. And so we also see that scene between Crowley and Nina, where he mm-hmm. asked her about, you know, well, what about a sudden rainstorm? Would you hide under an awning? And she's like, that was a strange question, you know. Uh, so we get to see, I wonder if we're going to see them in two different places, uh, in the next episode. Yeah. I, I, I'm still dumbfounded to the fact that why is Gabriel so out of it? Where is he? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still dumbfounded to, to the sense I'm like, all right, I know this is the vessel of Gabriel. I know that there is a part of Gabriel there, Mm -hmm. but what is God's plan? I'm really thinking this is God's plan. I don't think it has anything to do with hell or heaven in any Mm -hmm. sake. That's interesting. I I think it has to do with God's plan. Mm, That's an interesting take on it. I don't know. I I just still, I want to say again, John Hamm's comic timing is, is so. His comedic timing is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's just when he's, when he's, when they're asking him, they're asking him questions about the song and he goes, well, yeah, I sang it this morning. And they're like, where have you heard it before? This morning I heard it when I sang it. You know, it's like, <laughs> no, what's your first memory? And then he says that thing about the angels shouting for joy. And uh, he's like, well, that was as Crowley recognizes that was something God said to Job. And uh, again, I, I can't remember if that's an exact quote out of Job, but it may be an exact quote out of hmm. Job as well. Um, but that's a, all of this stuff coming back to Job is interesting. I got to see how that's going to work out. I, I also have questions too, about uh, the mention of Jane Austen throughout the episode and how Crowley is like, Oh, she was a secret spy. Yeah. And then it's like, Oh wait, wait, what? Oh, she wrote books. Yeah. She oh, wrote books goodness. also. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I thought like, that was, I thought that was a fun runner throughout, especially when he finds the books and he's like, Oh, she did write books, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm wondering if that's something that will play on later on. And we yeah. get to see Jane Austen at some point mm-hmm. and, and, and they're because they tend to do for every episode previously on or previously in their world Crowley right. and uh, Azarafel. I right. wouldn't be surprised if we travel back in time and the, their encounter with uh, Jane Austen Jane that, would Austen. Be <laughs> that would that would be interesting to see how that how that uh, uh, comes about and how her stories come about <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah uh, yeah, I just that was one of those things that I love that what is it? Zerafel says, Oh, she had balls, and and Crowley kind of goes, What? And he says, Cotillions, you know, the dances where <laughs> people would fall in love. And I just thought that was that was a great little misunderstanding there between the two of them. So that that was. And uh, I love how the fact that, you know, of course Zerafel has to have a sherry in the pub, whereas yeah. Crowley has to have a whiskey. So yeah, yeah. 
That it just great. differentiates both of who they are, and we all both know <laughs> what, what they're going to order anyway. Yeah, it's like precisely. it's either a wine from Azurafell or something like that, mm-hmm. and of course, whiskey or uh, bourbon from Crowley. Yeah. Uh, uh, the one quote that I do enjoy was uh, was Azurafell saying to the shop owner for the record store owner, and he goes, uh, "Can I get?" back to you on that i'm a bit out of miracles meaning yeah. that he's trying to figure out something to fix it yeah with yeah. her you know uh, uh that was the one quote that really stood out for me the only note that i would have about this particular episode because honestly listeners were keeping this a little bit short but bitite the shoeite was crowley's name for job and yeah. Job's wife when he was there at that Bildad, time. Yeah, Bildad the Shuite. And so, again, going back to the, the, uh, the book of Job, um, the whole book of Job is, it consists of uh, the very first chapter is where he loses everything. And then his wife tells him to curse God. And then he's visited by three friends throughout the book from chapter two, three, up until God responds to him. And I believe it's chapter 40 of the mm-hmm. book of Job, it's three friends come to him, build out the Shuite. And I can't remember the other two. I should have looked it up, but they're all basically asking. They're, they're having a debate with Job about why he's in this predicament and why this bad thing has happened to this good person. And so you have, I believe Bildad the Shuite was the only one who was basically kind of defending Job and going, well, no, you haven't done anything wrong. Whereas the other two, like throughout their debates with Job, they kind of get him, no, you should curse, just curse God and die, end your suffering. And Job's like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going yeah. to curse God and die. I, I have to take the good with the bad. If I'm going to are we going to praise it's it's that same understanding where he's you know it's the lord giveth and the lord taketh away mm-hmm. praise be the name of the lord that's the the verse from job where he says the lord gives and the lord takes away praise the lord you know he says i'm going to praise god no matter what no matter what my situation is and that's where that true joy comes from for job so so yeah, yeah so Bildad the shuite was one of the those three friends that visit job in the book of job and if you think about it what he had three children too within the, the show right yeah, I'm trying to remember if it was three or more than that. Uh, but three, I, it was three no in more the show. than three. But yeah, th- uh, I know it was three in the show, and I haven't. Like, it's been a while since I taught the Book of Job. I don't remember how many children he started out with. I don't know if they gave us an exact number, but they did remember. show three children in the show. Yeah. From yeah, what in I the know. show, right? And then they had three goats. So the three goats were turned into crows, right? And that was a way for Crowley to be like, well, I didn't want him to sacrifice these goats. And mm-hmm. it was his manipulation of the Lord's thought of like taking something away from Job. Mm-hmm. And then he does the same thing with the kids and turns them into what? What are those things where salamanders or lizards? Oh, salamanders, some, yeah. Some kind of, yeah, some kind yeah, of lizard. Some sort of lizard. And, and then later on, he brings them back and it's just like, yeah. he, he, he taketh and he giveth again. Right. You know, right. so it, it's kind of like within that same story structure, I think, but they kind of manipulated it. And that's where you have to like, you know, it's like you have to take it with a grain of salt. Mm-hmm. And it's these are adaptations and they're it's their way of trying to present something within a story. And it, it's kind of good storytelling in some way. But like you stated, Steve, it, it's kind of like uh, for those who don't read the book and believe in the book, it's their mm-hmm. interpretation of how it would have been so uh it's an interesting take on it and i do enjoy i did enjoy it uh, as a whole Uh, it was a good fictitious story i should say and uh i i did enjoy it and it was fun and uh then we move on to the next episode which we will not get into because we're going to cover that next week exactly exactly but i'm I'm excited to to get to the next episode because i think we're going to see we're going to see this pub what was the name of it the resurrectionist was the name of the pub so i've got (laughs) to wonder if there's another angel hiding out there or something it has to be what's going on yeah um so yeah i'm I'm really interested to see that i'm also i've got to investigate i keep watching this on amazon prime and it keeps saying something about there's webisodes out there Oh, that are supposed to be companion webisodes to these things. And I haven't uh, investigated that deeper. So I need to try to. We'll take a look into that before we get hit the next episode, ladies and gentlemen. So you'll probably be getting this on probably Monday. The I'm going to say 14th, 14th. 13th. So Wait, yeah, yeah, around 14th. the 14th, the 14th. Today's the 12th. So, so yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll get this episode by then at least. But mm-hmm. if you have any information, do send them out. Why? Uh, actually, you know, it's like, and as we move on, 
Uh, we'll get into a little bit comic news, but we'll also do recommendations. But right now, comic news. Something that I found really intriguing that finally took fruition last night on August 11th, they released uh, Spider-Man Lotus. So a little bit of comic news. Spider-Man Lotus was a uh, independent uh, fan-made film. And it's oh, been uh, okay. ridiculed for uh, the director and the actor's comments and previous through social media of like bigotry and whatnot. And uh, honestly, I watched the movie because I've been looking forward to it before all that stuff had come out. The movie itself was very good for a Spider-Man film. Very well done for an independent film. Uh, I reached out to the director to see if he'd be interested, but... You know, I haven't really heard from him yet, but they did a Los Angeles preview. And overall, my thoughts, which I'll do more in depth later on if we do actually cover it. Mm -hmm. uh, overall, right now, uh, I enjoyed it. Had the character and flavor of any Spider-Man comic and true to Peter Parker and the Spider-Man dynamic in it. And it was very it was done very well. And I would say four key scenes. Now, mind you, it's low budget. So obviously you have to take that with a grain of salt and uh, you could watch it. It's free on YouTube. So look for Spider-Man Lotus on YouTube if you're really interested in it. Okay. Uh, it it's 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 a good story. And that's yeah. that's how I'll leave it. Um, uh, there's a lot more coming out as far as Loki that's coming out. Uh, to give a little props out there, Podcastic is going to be covering Loki as well. So uh, Alex, Sydney, and Kirk Manley, who actually does our artwork for uh, Panels to Pixels, uh, is going to be uh, covering that on Podcastic, which is amazing. So uh, uh, if you want another companion series of cover that's covering Loki along with us and TV Podcast Industries, look for Podcastic when they do the Loki cast. So uh, that's one that I would recommend as podcast recommendation. Steve, yourself? Um, just the same thing we've been pushing. Obviously, TV Podcast Industries uh, is still out there doing their thing. Podcastica is uh, doing uh, some great stuff. Uh, I just listened to, or I haven't actually finished it, the Wilhelm podcast that Ben Beck does. He and Jason Cavassi did their top five Robin Williams Oh yeah, movies. I have to listen uh, to that. So yeah. that is, uh, I'm about halfway through it now. It's really, really good. Can't wait to to hear the rest of that one. So I definitely check out the Wilhelm podcast uh, with Ben Beck. All right, well, uh, listeners, we we said to where to send your feedback, and we always talk about feedback. <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah, we can be heard on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or whatever podcast player of choice. If there's a rating available, please do give a rating. Apple Podcasts, preferably, because that's the premier most podcast that everybody refers to and people look to uh, as far as uh, podcast recommendations. So if you could give us a review there, it would be greatly appreciated. You could go to our Facebook group, which would be facebook.com forward slash panels to pixels. I do put out a uh, an image and saying leave your comments in below. I did that recently. Mm -hmm. We didn't get anything. I also did that on Instagram, which you can find us on Instagram at Panels to Pixels Podcast. So that's you can follow one. us there. <laughs> I had to get that. That was the longest. I, I That was the only way I could get that Instagram handle. And it's hey, super it works. long, but it's at least the it works. actual title. So yeah, it works. Panels to Pixels Podcast. <laughs> and you can also email us at Panels to pixels one at gmail.com. That's panels two is spelled out to pixels and the number one at gmail.com. You could just send out a, a written texted email and we'll read it on the podcast of your thoughts. If you feel like you don't want to write out anything and you just want to talk, you can record yourself easily, do that, and then set up an email to panels to pixels one at gmail.com and send that as an attachment and we could play it on the podcast live and you can yep. be part of the podcast very cool and we can be found on youtube as well all you have to do is search for panels to pixels podcast and it, while you're there please give us a thumbs up subscribe and hit the notification bell so that way you know a lot of people like to do that apparently we get a lot of listeners that way too <laughs> and a lot of and and some feedback here and there very but, cool yeah so uh and where else can listeners hear us steve 
Well, uh, really mainly I'm doing this panels to pixels podcast, but also I send voicemails to various other podcasts, uh, particularly right now. The the main one that's still going is Podcastica's. Yeah, it's Podcastica mainly. It was a joint podcast between Ben Bex uh, and and Podcastica, but Ben Bex is kind of just out there. But the the revisited, it's called revisited the uh, lost. I'm stumbling over my words. What's what's the it's revisited. Anyway, the revisited, revisited. We have to go back. Yeah, revisit lost. a lost a lost podcast. Uh, they're almost done with lost, and they're going to start doing something else. Uh, so I send them voicemails every week uh, uh, there with r- various live steves of that uh, that episode. And you do a lot of the live steves too for podcasts, yeah. like for Run for Your Lives, uh, yeah, Strange haven't Indeed. Been, haven't been like doing that. as much of those lately, but uh, but yeah, some sometimes I'll get in there. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you could hear me also as well at uh, Adrenaline Cinema Podcast as well. I, I think the last episode we put up was The Lost Boys with myself and Rima from Strange Indeed from Podcastica. Uh, coming up, you'll be hearing Space Camp from 1986. So it's going to be a round table. So it's going to be at least a good four of us, I would say, at least. Uh, that will be on that, and we'd be covering that. That movie had Leah Thompson, Tate Donovan, Kate Capshaw, Tom Skerritt, and a whole bunch of people, too. Uh, you know, Joaquin Phoenix. So we'll be covering that. It, it's kind of a lost icon kind of movie. Something to segue into what we love, which is the 80s, and kind of like a little crossover promotion for somebody who's making a comeback, which would be Damien Vitale, who does Watched It in the 80s. So Damien's coming back with Watched It in the 80s. I'm kind of pushing him to do the movie Explorers with uh, River Phoenix and Ethan Hawke in it. So I'm hoping to cover that with him on his podcast. So uh, Damien, if you're listening, we still got to do it. <laughs> but uh yeah you can hear me there on adrenaline cinema podcast uh, as well as uh <laughs> fantasy picks movie edition with rob frank uh adam and myself and sometimes zach depending on if we cover a uh, star wars film so uh you can check me out there on fantasy picks movie edition as well i think the last one that we did was blade runner 2049 and how mm-hmm. to fix that movie and make it a better movie <laughs> but uh, you can check that out. But for the most part, we're right here on Panels to Pixels podcast. We're currently doing uh, Good Omens. We're going to move slowly into other shows. We will have a Howard the Duck 1986 37th anniversary movie review with our friend Des. So we'll be covering that and we'll be having a good time with that. So in between certain episodes, you'll you'll get certain Mesa did something for that one since okay. you had, haven't recorded it yet. So. Yeah, we haven't recorded it yet. I, I, my, uh, in front of my apartment complex, the, uh, the pole went down that had the transformer on it. So I was mm. out of power. So I went to go see Oppenheimer for about three hours and it came back on by nice. the time I get back. So, nice. uh, but yeah, we'll be covering Howard the Duck. So you look forward to that. If you have any thoughts about that movie, please send them our way too. Uh, you already know where to send that to. So uh, enough of that. That, uh, that. that was our podcast. And I just want to thank everybody for listening. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. Same podcast, different panel, different pixel. And this was Panels to Pixel Podcast. And we'll see you on the next panel. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.